His name was Omar Khayyam, and he travelled widely across the Middle East, calculating as he went. But he was famous for another very different reason. Khayyam was a celebrated poet, author of the great epic poem, The Rubaiyat. Now, it may seem a bit odd that a poet was also a master mathematician. After all, the combination doesn't immediately spring to mind. But in fact, there's quite a lot of similarity between the two disciplines. Poetry, with its rhyming structure and rhythmic patterns, resonates quite strongly with constructing a logical mathematical proof. Chayam's major mathematical work was devoted to finding the general method to solve all cubic equations. Rather than looking at particular examples, Chayam carried out a systematic analysis of the problem, true to the algebraic spirit of al kharizmi Chayam's analysis revealed for the first time that there were several different sorts of cubic equations. But what held him back is that he was still very influenced by the geometric heritage of the Greeks. He couldn't separate the algebra from the geometry. In fact, he wouldn't even consider equations in higher degrees, because they described geometric objects in more than three dimensions, something he regarded as impossible. Although the geometry allowed him to analyse these cubic equations to some extent, he still couldn't come up with a purely algebraic solution. It would be another 500 years before mathematicians could make the leap and find a general solution to the cubic equation. And that leap would finally be made in the West, in Italy. During the centuries in which China, India and the Islamic Empire had been in the ascendant, Europe had fallen under the shadow of the Dark Ages. All intellectual life, including the study of mathematics, had stagnated. But by the 13th century, things were beginning to change. Led by Italy, Europe was starting to explore and trade with the East. And with that contact came the spread of Eastern knowledge to the West. It was the son of a customs official that would become Europe's first great medieval mathematician. As a child, he travelled around North Africa with his father, where he learnt about the developments of Arabic mathematics, and especially the benefits of the Hindu-Arabic numerals. When he got home to Italy, he wrote a book that would be hugely influential in the development of Western mathematics. The mathematician was called Leonardo of Pisa, better known as Fibonacci. And in his Book of Calculating, Fibonacci promoted the new number system, demonstrating how simple it was compared to the Roman numerals that were in use across Europe. Calculations were far easier, a fact that had huge consequences for anyone dealing with numbers. Pretty much everyone, from mathematicians to merchants. But there was widespread suspicion of these new numbers. Old habits die hard, and the authorities just didn't trust them. Some believed that they would be more open to fraud, that you could tamper with them. Others believed that they'd be so easy to use for calculations that it would empower the masses, taking authority away from the intelligentsia, who knew how to use the old sort of numbers. The city of Florence even banned them in 1299. But over time, common sense prevailed. The new system spread throughout Europe, and the old Roman system slowly became defunct. At last, the Hindu Arabic numerals 0 to 9 had triumphed. Today, Fibonacci is best known for the discovery of some numbers now called the Fibonacci sequence. The numbers arose when he was trying to solve a riddle about the mating habit of rabbits. Suppose a farmer has a pair of rabbits. Now rabbits take two months to reach maturity, and after that they give birth to another pair of rabbits each month. 
So the problem was how to determine how many pairs of rabbits there will be in any given month. Well, during the first month, you have one pair of rabbits. And since they haven't matured, they can't reproduce. During the second month, there's still only one pair. But at the beginning of the third month, the first pair reproduces for the first time, so there are two pairs of rabbits. At the beginning of the fourth month, the first pair reproduces again, but the second pair is not mature enough, so there are three pairs. In the fifth month, the first pair reproduces, and the second pair reproduces for the first time. But the third pair is still too young, so there are five pairs. The mating ritual continues. But what you soon realise is the number of pairs of rabbits you have in any given month is the sum of the pairs of rabbits that you've had in each of the two previous months. So the sequence goes one, one, two, three, five, eight, thirteen, twenty-one, thirty-four, fifty-five, and so on. The Fibonacci numbers are nature's favourite numbers. It's not just rabbits that use them. If you count the number of petals on a flower, it's invariably a Fibonacci number. You find these numbers running up and down pineapples if you count the number of segments. Even snails use them to grow their shells. Wherever you find growth in nature, you find the Fibonacci numbers. But the next major breakthrough in European mathematics wouldn't happen until the early 16th century. It would involve finding the general method that would solve all cubic equations. And it would happen here in the Italian city of Bologna. The University of Bologna was the crucible of European mathematical thought at the beginning of the 16th century. Pupils from all over Europe flocked here and developed a new form of spectator sport, the mathematical competition. Large audiences would gather to watch mathematicians challenge each other with numbers, a kind of intellectual fencing match. But even in this questioning atmosphere, it was believed that some problems were just unsolvable. It was generally assumed that finding a general method to solve all cubic equations was impossible. But one scholar was to prove everyone wrong. His name was Tartaglia, but he certainly didn't look the heroic architect of a new mathematics. At the age of 12, he'd been slashed across the face with a sabre by a rampaging French army. The result was a terrible facial scar and a devastating speech impediment. In fact, Tartaglia was the nickname he'd been given as a child, a means the stammerer. Shunned by his schoolmates, Tartaglia lost himself in mathematics. And it wasn't long before he'd found the formula to solve one type of cubic equation. But Tartaglia soon discovered that he wasn't the only one to believe he'd cracked the cubic. A young Italian called Fior was boasting that he too held the secret formula for solving cubic equations. When news broke about the discoveries made by the two mathematicians, a competition was arranged to pit them against each other. The intellectual fencing match of the century was about to begin. The trouble was that Tartaglia only knew how to solve one sort of cubic equation, and Fiore was ready to challenge him with questions about a different sort. But just a few days before the contest, Tartaglia worked out how to solve this different sort, and with this new weapon in his arsenal, he thrashed his opponent, solving all the questions in under two hours. Tartaglia went on to find the formula to solve all types of cubic equations. News soon spread, and a mathematician in Milan called Cardano became so desperate to find the solution that he persuaded a reluctant Tartaglia to reveal the secret to him. But on one condition, that Cardano keep the secret and never publish. 
But Cardano couldn't resist discussing Tartaglia's solution with his brilliant student Ferrari. As Ferrari got to grips with Tartaglia's work, he realised that he could use it to solve the more complicated quartic equation. An amazing achievement! Cardano couldn't deny his student his just rewards, and he broke his vow of secrecy, publishing Tartaglia's work together with Ferrari's brilliant solution of the quartic. Poor Tartaglia never recovered and died penniless. And to this day, the formula that solves the cubic equation is known as Cardano's formula. Tartaglia may not have won glory in his lifetime, but his mathematics managed to solve a problem that had bewildered the great mathematicians of China, India and the Arab world. It was the first great mathematical breakthrough to happen in modern Europe. The Europeans now had in their hands the new language of algebra, the powerful techniques of the Hindu Arabic numerals, and the beginnings of the mastery of the infinite. It was time for the Western world to start writing its own mathematical stories in the language of the East. The mathematical revolution was about to begin. You can learn more about the story of maths with the Open University at open2.net. Tomorrow at 8 here on BBC4, we take a look at the mathematics of chaos, unravelling our complex times in high anxieties. Back to tonight, though, and Storyville takes on the story of one of Hollywood's most controversial directors, Roman Polanski, next. Thank you.